Elliot Rodger was just 22 when he wrote a, a manifesto, a 141-page manifesto, in which he determined that he was going to annihilate all women. First of all, he was going to start with his six-year-old uh, brother, then he was going to murder his stepmother, and in the event, fortunately, he did neither of those two things, but instead he stabbed to death two of his fellow students and uh, another student, uh, and shortly afterwards uh, killed, uh, shot dead uh, two female students and a male student before turning the gun on himself. You might have remembered hearing that incident, but then there are so many similar incidents that after a while they fade from the memory. He was possessed by something, wasn't he? He was certainly possessed by real hatred, hatred in his case for the opposite sex. He'd been blighted by a, a blonde girl many, many years before and it had turned his mind in some way. But the question we want to investigate this afternoon is, was he possessed by a devil or a demon? And, and that's a big issue for some people. There are people who believe that when they look in the mirror, there could well be another demon looking back at them. Well, they can't see him, but they believe he's there. And if you, if you were to probe through the internet to, to invite yourself to find the signs of what might constitute demon possession, and I'm not recommending this, then um, you'd find these sorts of um, pointers being offered. Demon possession is when Satan or a demon enters and takes over the physical and mental capabilities of a victim. <coughs> Satan acts through the victim without the victim's consent. Thus the victim is morally blameless because somebody else or something else has taken control of those particular mental uh, aptitudes and abilities. And, you know, it's not just the internet. If you, if you read some evangelical Christian literature, uh, this, like this one, I believe in Satan's downfall by Michael Green, and Michael Green is a very well-respected evangelical writer, then he will actually offer you a whole range. I've only offered you 11 pointers here, but uh, he'll offer you a whole range of things that might indicate that somebody who is acting a little peculiarly is in fact being possessed. An irrational and violent reaction against the name of Jesus. Violent struggles with a strength out of proportion. Allegedly then, if you're struggling with somebody and they seem to have unreasonable strength, you could say, somebody is possessing them. An involvement in occult practices now or in the past and so on. So there are a lot of people who seriously think that you can be controlled and therefore directed in your thinking and in your actions by a supernatural devil. Of course, it begs a huge question at the outset, and that is that there is such a thing as a supernatural devil, and secondly, that that devil can actually wheedle its way or his way into your mind and take control of you. But how do we find these things out? Is it a matter of just analysing the people that we know and their irrational behaviour? Well, this is a Bible talk, so we're going to be examining and considering how many times, for example, the word devil appears in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. It's never found in the Old Testament, the word devil, but of course the word Satan is found there occasionally, and Satan can mean an adversary of one sort or another, somebody who stands in the way, somebody who opposes. Well, how many times do you think the word Satan appears in the Hebrew Old Testament? It's actually 27. So there are only 27 references to Satan, and the Satan in the Old Testament can take the form of an angel, can take the form of God in some instances, can take the form of surrounding nations, all sorts of influences and forces that oppose the purpose of God. How many times do you think the word demon or demons appears in the Old Testament? Just four times the word demon or demons occurs in the Old Testament. Let's have a look at them. Here's the first. There are two Hebrew words and they're translated, two Hebrew words translated to demons and, and, and here they are. Here, here are the first two. The priest shall sprinkle the blood on the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting and burn the fat for a sweet aroma to the Lord. They shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons after whom they have played the harlot. 
this shall be a statute forever for them throughout the generations. This is when Moses in Leviticus chapter 17 was arranging for Israel to come now to offer their sacrifices at the door of the tabernacle. They weren't to offer their sacrifices in the way that they had been offered them, offering them before. And the problem was that before they had been offering those sacrifices to the gods that they had brought out with them in their minds and in their hearts from Egypt. And all that was to stop. And now they were to come to the tabernacle and there they were to worship. He is Moses at the end of his 120 year uh, long life saying this about Israel's history as he looked back. They provoked God to jealousy with foreign gods. With abominations they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God, to gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. Of the rock who begot you, you are unmindful and have forgotten the God who fathered you. Do you remember when Moses was up in the mountain for 40 days that in fact Aaron had been persuaded to create an image that the children of Israel could worship and again it was a, a bull god like the god that was revered in Egypt they all cried out together when that golden calf had been constructed these be your gods o, o Israel that brought you out of the land of Egypt that's that's how far removed they were and so they provoked God to anger, but they sacrificed, says the record, to demons. So that's the first Hebrew word. The next two Hebrew words. For the Levites left their common lands and their possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had rejected them from serving as priests to the Lord. This in 2 Chronicles chapter 11 is when the nation had split into two. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, had created a false religious system in the north. And again, he had established two golden calves, remember. One in Dan and one at Bethel. And had said to the children of Israel, don't go to worship in Jerusalem. Instead, I'll make you a religious system. Then he appointed for himself priests for the high places, for the demons and the calf idols which he had made. When he created these calves in Dan and Bethel and invited Israel to worship, these be your gods, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So notice again that we've looked at three of those occurrences, and in those three occurrences, it all has to do with the fact that demons are a way of describing false gods or idols, things that have been created by the children of Israel when they were lapsing in their worship and forgetting the true God. And here's the, the last of those occurrences from Psalm 106. And again, it's a, a recap of Israel's faltering history. But they mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. This is a reference, remember, to the terrible worship of the god Molech, when in fact infant children were being offered as sacrifices to appease the wrath of that supposed angry deity. Uh, and you'll notice again that quite clearly in this passage, Psalm 106 and verses 39 and onwards, the demons are aligned with idols that the children of Israel had made and idols that they had made to imitate what was happening in the land of Canaan. So we've looked at the whole of the range of the Old Testament references to demons and what we found is that demons are another way of describing idols. So new gods, new gods that people have made for themselves. And I suppose when you leap across the 400 years that separate the Old Testament to the New Testament, what you find is that the same sort of language actually carries forward. In fact, um, if you remember when the Apostle Paul came to Mars Hill, and when he began there to, to preach about the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the reaction he got from the rather snooty um, people, the intelligentsia who were there in, in Athens, was this. While Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. 
Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. And, and can you see there that, in fact, the, the word for foreign gods is the word in Greek, diamonion, diamonion, the demons, in other words, for the New Testament thought of foreign gods in exactly the same way. Demons were foreign gods. And the Apostle has quite a lot to say about whether or not you should ever worship these foreign gods. You see, in, um, old, in New Testament times, uh, you couldn't pop into a local um, McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken um, fast food restaurant. If you went to have a meal out, you had to go to a temple. So you might be invited to go to a restaurant that was next to the temple. It made perfect sense as far as the temple was concerned. They had a lot of meat floating around from sacrifices that had been offered. Why couldn't they get people to come and pay to actually eat it? And so you might be invited to go and say, would you come and have a meal with my Lord Serapis at the Serapurium? Which would invite you then to go to an idle temple to have a meal. But it could be a business meal and you might need those sorts of contacts. So, contact. so the Apostle Paul here now analyses that situation and says, what do you think? Can you go or can't you go? Therefore, concerning the, eat the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. So he says, you know, you look at it clinically and rationally, it wasn't offered to anybody, because the idols that they offered it to didn't exist. So yeah, go on, if you want to tuck into your steak, go and enjoy it, and don't worry about it. Later on he says, but of course if it's going to cause offence or upset to other people, maybe you need to think again. But there's his first rational uh, um, analysis of the situation. And he later goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 10, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God, and I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. So you notice in exactly the same way that he's linking idols and demons in just the way that we saw in the Old Testament, the very same linkage being made. So what are these demons of which the Apostle is speaking? He's talking about false gods, about idols that were made. If you looked at the Greek Old Testament, there is one other reference where the word demons is translated, this time in the Greek, and here's the passage. It's uh, Isaiah chapter 63. I stretched out my hand, says the prophet on God's behalf, all day long to a people who broke faith and opposed, to those who walked in a way that was not good, but followed after their own sins. This people who provokes me is before me always. They sacrifice in their gardens and burn incense on their bricks to demons that do not exist. Notice it's exactly the same analysis the Apostle Paul had offered. A demon is nothing, so the meat isn't being offered to anything. And in exactly the same way, Isaiah here, 600 years before the Lord Jesus, is actually reminding us that when Israel were offering sacrifices in private to uh, the gods that they worshipped in secret, they were actually not offering to anything because those gods did not exist. So we've, we've looked there to see everything that the Old um, Testament, both in Hebrew and now in Greek, actually has to say. And, and one thing you need to be very clear about, there is no reference in any of those passages to the idea of demon possession. Instead, it's simply a way of speaking about idols that were often worshipped by people who should have known better, but those idols had no substance except in the minds of the people in question. So that's bound to raise the question, if there is no reference to demon possession, how come people began to believe in demon possession? And the answer, as I've just inferred, is in the mind. Their mindset began to change as they were influenced 
by people from other nations and other cultures. And the idea of demon possession is deep-rooted in pagan religion of one sort or another. Here's the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary, one of the most recent and uh, most authoritative Bible dictionaries. Uh, and this is what the, uh, the, the writer says about this subject. A belief in the existence and activity of demons is not limited to the New Testament. Some conception of evil spirits or demons was held almost universally by the religions of the ancient world. Many of these religions had developed a rather extensive demonology. Egyptian religion included the use of magical incantations to ward off disease and misfortune caused by malevolent spirits. You've probably seen those, those writings on the tomb walls and so on, where people <clears throat> are trying through magic to frighten off uh, things that they believed would, would cause the, the person a, a problem in their afterlife. Greek popular belief postulated a class of spirit beings, possibly spirits of the dead, between men and the gods. These, these beings could afflict people with madness and sickness. Zoroastrianism, that's the ancient Persian religion, conceived a dualism in the spirit world with a dark kingdom of demons under the direction of Ahriman, warning against the spirit of light led by Ahura Mazda. Those of you who are old enough to remember Mazda light bulbs will be pleased to know that that, that name came from Persian religion. Ahura Mazda was the god of light. And then he goes on to add, though the Hebrew concept of Yahweh's sovereignty minimised the development of demonology in the canonical writings, Jewish literature began in the intertestamental period, that's between the two testaments, to elaborate on the origin and activity of malevolent spirits. So in those 400 years, when God was not communicating with his people, they began to spin all sorts of fancy ideas uh, themselves and, and that led to uh, a lot of confusion. If you look at Josephus for example the Jewish historian he has a little warning for you here because he says that in fact the Romans believed in demon possession and I have seen he says a certain man of my country whose name was Eliezer releasing people that were demoniacal in the presence of Vespasian. Remember, Vespasian was the emperor who, uh, who left the siege of Jerusalem and went on to, uh, to become the emperor, and his sons and his captains and the whole multitude of his soldiers. The manner of the cure was this. He put a ring that had a root of one of those sorts mentioned by Solomon to the nostrils of the demoniac, after which he drew out the demon through his nostrils. So if you see anybody heading towards you with a ring and with the root of something that you've never seen before, run would be my uh, advice there, particularly if he looks he's an ancient Roman. But you can see then that the idea was already substantially there. And of course, remember that Jerusalem at the time of the New Testament was occupied by the Romans. So the Jews were a subject nation. But there were other people who held control over the nations as well. It was very much a, a religious nation which was held in control, under control by the religious authorities. And that was the world into which the Lord Jesus was born. A world in which many people believed in demon possession, a world in which certainly the Romans did, and a world in which the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees held strong opinions of their own about such matters. Well now, did you notice that in the passage that we were reading with David from Matthew chapter 12, if you've got your Bible handy, just come and have a look at it. You notice there that something very strange happens during the course of our reading. It begins, remember, with uh, Jesus going into a, a synagogue and there's a challenge there about whether he will heal or not on the Sabbath day. And in verse 12, uh, we read Jesus saying, well, is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? And he said to the man who was uh, suffering here from a, an arm that wasn't working, stretch forth thine hand and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the others. And the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. They were very upset by the fact that Jesus had cured this man on the Sabbath day. But you'll notice what the cure was. He had a, a withered hand, 
and Jesus invited him to stretch it out and he stretched it out and it was cured just like the other one. And you notice there's, there's no mention there in any way of any demon possession. And the record goes on to say that the Pharisees went out and plotted against him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there and a great multitude followed him and he healed them all. So Jesus was busy healing and in this instance he had healed a withered hand. But as the record continues, now look at verse 22. Then one was brought to him who was demon possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him. So that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And this time, the record says he was a demon-possessed man because he was blind and mute. And you notice the, the difference there. A man who's got a withered hand has got a withered hand. It's pretty obvious what the trouble is. He's got a withered hand. But a person who is blind or mute appears to have all the organs that should be doing the trick. But for some reason or other, they're not doing the trick. He's got eyes, but they don't seem to be able to see He's got all the apparatus for being able to speak, but he can't talk. And so it was that in that uh, very superstitious arena, people said, well, there's obviously nothing wrong with him, so somebody must have taken control of him. And that's the key. Where the expression comes demon-possessed, then it's the key that people labelled somebody as being possessed when they couldn't understand why they couldn't do what their obvious apparatus suggested they should be able to do. So what's the reaction of the Pharisees this time? Well, look how the record goes on now. The Pharisees said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them and begins to say, Well, OK, let's, let's reason this through on a rational basis. Who was Beelzebub? The Lord of the Flies. But, but who was he? Where did he come from? Beelzebub, if you translated it, would mean Lord of the Flies. But where does it come from? He appears in the Old Testament. He comes into the Old Testament on a particular occasion. Here's the passage. Ahaziah fell ill, 2 Kings chapter 1. Ahaziah the king fell through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and was injured. So he sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron. So he was a Philistine god, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it because there is no god in Israel that you're going to inquire of Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron? So he was a Philistine god. And how come the Sadducees are saying... This Jesus who's curing this man, he must be curing him by the god of Ekron. They didn't believe in the god of Ekron, so it seems a very strange thing. Why would the Philistines call their god Lord of the Flies? I mean, that sounds a strange name to give your god, doesn't it? What god do you worship? I worship the fly god. You think, no, I, I, I somehow don't think so. And in fact, the, what has happened here is that the Hebrews have deliberately twisted the word, which actually means lord of the house, Beelzebul, and they've deliberately twisted it to make fun of it, to poke fun at it. And by just changing the ul to the ub, they have therefore made it into Lord of the Flies, which is an entirely correct interpretation. So, so this is something then that they were, they were poking fun at Jesus and saying, oh, well, there you go, he must have done it with the help of the Lord of the Flies. And the Lord Jesus answers them very rationally and very carefully. So they said he has Beelzebub, remember, poking fun, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. But look at the record in Mark chapter 3. So he called them to himself and said to them, in parables, so Jesus is going to speak to them in parable terms now, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. 
And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. So Jesus says, all right, then let's take you on at your own game. You think that a false god has enabled me to throw out this sickness that the false god had first uh, brought into existence. So is there civil war then in the kingdom of the false gods? I think not. So the Lord Jesus is able to turn the tables on them brilliantly. Let's look at another instance, uh, and an instance this time um, which uh, encounters a man who was quite clearly mentally deranged, a man who was so ill that nobody could keep him in, uh, safely in any institution, so they, they locked him up and chained him up and posted him out in, in a cemetery area where there was a cave and where he was uh, forced to go. And Jesus encounters this man and he says, What have I got to do with you, you son of God? And he answered, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There was about 2,000 and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. <laughs> now there's a man who quite clearly felt that he was possessed by a whole range, a whole legion of demons. And the only way that he could uh, ever be set free was for these pigs to take the demons away. And they all rushed into the, the Lake Sea of Galilee and were drowned and as a result of that, the man came to himself. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And do you notice the very language? Sitting and clothed and in his right mind indicated that he had had mental illness and that Jesus had healed him of his mental illness. And incidentally, what the Lord was showing was that thousands of pigs are not to be compared to the sanity of one person who could become a follower of his. You know, there is a very interesting suggestion that these pigs actually belonged to Herod Antipas because the Romans loved pork more than any other meat. And whilst the Jews were not allowed to keep pigs because they were deemed unclean, this was not Jewish territory. This was Gentile territory abutting Israel. And as such, where would you place your pigs? You'd place them very close at hand, but you'd have other people look after them. And if the Lord Jesus also got rid of Herod's um, pension fund at the side and destroyed them, then he was fulfilling two, uh, uh, two things at once. He was curing Legion of his mental insanity and he was removing Herod's pigs. But, but that's just for you to ponder. Here's another instance then that the scripture speaks of where there were epileptic people and others and notice again the comparison in Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand and the fever left her and she arose and served them. She had a fever. She was running high temperature. She was perspiring. It was obvious that she was ill. Jesus cured her. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying he himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness, sicknesses. You see, those problems were infirmities and sicknesses, and the Lord Jesus was able to heal those that were sick. So whenever the, we encounter people who have no obvious physical problems, then unfortunately they were deemed to be demon-possessed. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, it says of the Lord, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Again, it's a healing process, not exotism. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples, 
and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem, from the sea coasts of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from them, and he healed them all. You see, this is a healing ministry that the Lord is undertaking. He's not casting out demons. He's healing people of sicknesses, some of them physical and obvious, some of them mental and not so obvious. So let's see if we can draw a few conclusions together. The Old Testament, remember, says nothing about the devil. Only 27 references to Satan, but I know you've got that clearly lodged now. And the demons it describes are false gods or idols, which only exist in the minds of their worshippers. Only four references, remember, in the uh, Hebrew Old Testament, one more in the Greek, in the Septuagint translation. And the New Testament talks about demon possession when describing some illnesses, because that was the language of the day. That's what people spoke about and thought about. That was the, 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 the extent, unfortunately, of their, their medical and psychological grasp at that time. So when Jesus casts out demons, he was healing ill people, people who had problems that were not immediately apparent but still needed healing in just the same way. And that terminology, the demon terminology, came from ancient pagan sources, Egyptian, Persian, Greek and Roman myths and religions. They, they were not things that God had revealed, but ideas that people had made up. And what the Bible says is that God is superior to all, and that there are no false gods, because God is the master of all things. And you know, there's one Old Testament passage where... The apostle speaks, the prophet speaks in advance, uh, more than 150 years in advance of the Persian Empire coming and sends a message to the king who was to be appointed to Cyrus. And Cyrus, remember, was a dualist. He was a Zoroastrian. He believed in a god of good and a god of evil. I won't press you here to tell me who those gods were, but I know you could remember them if you really thought. And this is what Isaiah says. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God beside me. There is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. It isn't a case where the Hiram Mazda and Ahriman are fighting it out. God is the God who forms light and creates darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. I am the Lord and there is no other. So I hope you feel that as we've worked together at those scriptures and looked at what the Bible says, not what people think the Bible says, that we've come to understand that this is the best way to understand about demon possession, that the scriptures are telling us that God is supreme over all and that in the time of the Lord Jesus he was able to heal and to cure people who were both physically and mentally ill. And the Bible is offering us that sort of help still as we read it, quietly think about it. It can help us all to come to right-mindedness and to prepare ourselves for the great things that lie ahead when our Lord Jesus returns.